How's it going folks? Jack here with another video. So I was just casually sitting here trying to edit um, some content for my Dragon's Dogma 2 review where I got a notification from nothing but Ubisoft Connect to check out a new addition to the store. Now let's just say that it's not sitting right with me. The thing that I'm talking about here is Star Wars Outlaw, a game that I have mentioned some time ago as I was actually invited to check out the gameplay by Massive Entertainment on the Ubisoft Connect event, I do believe so, last year, and genuinely I had some positive thoughts about it. But all of that has shifted to something completely different because of the recent way that uh, Ubisoft have been assessing things. For those of you who are watching more than just the reaction content on the channel, you will know that I a few months ago made a video on the whole situation with Ubisoft's desire to make us more and more dependent on online infrastructure. You serious? Ubisoft has now come under scrutiny for seemingly wanting gamers to not be comfortable with owning their games. Well, at least it is being reported as such. Whereas the real title should be Ubisoft Execs wants gamers to embrace subscription services. And yeah, let's be totally honest, it's going to lead to the former. And with the addition of this title, it's not difficult to see where this might be going. Now, to put things a bit more into perspective is, if I switch here to show you my screen and go to the uh, pre-order page, in question we can see the pricing obviously this has been adjusted in danish crowns because i'm living in europe but this is 69.99 and of course the fee that you can access the game to a subscription service for uh what is it a hundred on there comes a train. I'm recording at an odd hour right now because obviously, I, normally I do edit right now. We have the subscription service for Ubisoft Premium that you can then pay and play early uh, for 18 or so dollars a month. And this is obviously the direction where these things might be going. But if we go even further down, this is the thing that I suppose a lot of people are getting mad about, which is fully understandable and I will too. The reason why I'm saying this in this way is that luckily in the position that I am as a content creator, which I emphasize quite a lot when it comes to these discussions about these videos and why content creators have a different, sometimes a different perspective, is that we tend to get games for free because they want us to advertise their shit. I will get back to this point. but. The thing is, since Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I gave up completely on buying any AC game and just Ubisoft games in general. I've been playing all the titles and those are the ones that I stock up with. But when you t look at the prices for this one, we're talking about the base one, $69.99 for a standard edition, $109.00 translated here to US dollars, right? For the gold edition, base game, the pre-order bonuses to get to play the game three days early, which is just a stupid thing. And of course, the season pass. Now, if the season pass is anything like what we've seen in the previous entries, like let's say, if I check out here in my library, good old Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, yeah, it's not going to be good. Guess what? I paid for not just the full package for this game, but because I was super hyped up for the whole Viking things, it was going to be stories perhaps about this. I could be nerding out, just making content about the histories of Vikings. I don't know if I'm ever going to get around that stuff, but nevertheless, the point was that I had bought the season passes, like access to supposedly all of them, but all of the additional content, all of the extra DLCs are priced. And the fact that this is even showing up as an additive for me to buy extra when I already own the fucking thing is beyond me. Like, you know how Steam tends to do the whole thing of, oh, you want to buy this extra stuff? You already own it. It's already in your library. Ubisoft doesn't do that. They are way too comfortable to just let you add another thing onto your cart. It's fucking ridiculous. And, and get this, it gets better. Because if we check out what the season pass has to offer, right? You get two DLCs that will release after launch. Keep exploring the world of Star Wars Outlaw in all of the new stories, quests, and areas to discover. Uh, the Jabba's Gambit exclusive mission available at launch. Okay. 
the three days early, it don't matter, you get that at launch. It's artificially locked there just for you to pre-order the bloody thing. The Kessel Runner character pack, uh, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. It's bad. And then of course they want you to pay for the ultimate edition where you get all the, the extra fluff. And they know for damn sure that most people don't want to pay that, which is why this exists. The ultimate edition, which you can then spend $18 paying for. This right here is the thing that they want you to buy, what they want you to invest in. But wait! There's more. What makes this even more clearer is when you, for example, start browsing on uh, that platform where Source goes to die called Twitter, where people have been discussing the uh, release date and several other stuff that has been leaked about the game. The box art for this, which you can see here, has this very thing right here in the bottom. Requires internet to be able to die. Why? It's gonna be yet another one of those cases where the box is literally useless. It's just a bloody coaster for you to put your coffee on while you wonder why you wasted your money on the game. Look, this thing might turn out good, okay? But I will not buy this. But I might play it if the game is given to me for free. The same thing I did with Frontier of Pandora. I actually ended up being quite an enjoyable adventure. The, the Far Cry system that works better for a game that is not even Far Cry. And if I call back again to the previous video that I made, I very much compare the subscription service that we're seeing right now in gaming with uh, that of the music industry, because it had a lot of positive aspects, right? Or I know there's some boomer who's going to comment in the comment section that in my time we were using cassettes. And you know what? That's fine, but we're talking about Napster right now. Now, Napster was one of those sites that most likely inspired the whole downfall of the uh, music industry for a certain while. Because of the rampant piracy that that site created, many were thinking that the music industry was going to die. And inadvertently, this resulted in the creation of music streaming services as we know them today. And while sites like Napster did affect music, that evolved later on into movies, to books, and now we are observing something similar for video games. I'm very working hard here trying to figure out the positive side of what they imagine to themselves might be good for the consumer here. But smaller creators whose games are included in these subscription services get discovered. And additionally to this, I think I did mention the accessibility loft of video games in other countries. I'm betting that a lot of you have been enjoying many games through such subscription service. Even Epic, while definitely not being profitable, has been given up a lot of games every single week and some of them are even ranging between the double a and the triple a level of quality and literally the biggest argument that i can make for such services is just how easy it aids one to get into the ecosystem of gaming you don't need to engage in the console war nor do you have to be exclusively part of the pc master race to get access to newer titles and with the rise of game prices that are now at 60 to 70 dollars and freaking gta 6 that is said to be 150 what the fuck is that the way that the prices are getting discounted counted allows you to have a lot more accessibility to titles that you might never have had originally and that's all well and good if this is where things stopped but that is obviously not the aim here they want us to be more comfortable with not owning your game you serious and really here there's nothing new under the sun this is not new information they've been doing this for almost a decade the problem is that it's gotten a lot worse and look this is massive entertainment's trailer for this and the thing has been mass downvoted it's it's really bad it's it really sucks and that is despite the fact that they make good ass games okay i've talked about a game of mine uh, that uh, i absolutely love called the division 2 it works wonderfully and I have no doubt that they might be able to put out something good, but because of Ubisoft's reputation, because of the fact that most of us are likely just to think that they might just be releasing the same thing that we've seen in the past with just a different coat of paint, these are the reasons that people are being worried in the first place. Of course, that's the whole thing with uh, Star Wars as a franchise, just never catching a break. But adding to this, the recent business practices, and you can clearly understand 
understand why people are uncomfortable with this. Thing is, when stuff like this keep on happening, it is understandable that there's been such a huge movement for game preservation. Like the recent video that was put out by Ross from um, uh, Accursed Farms, who talked about possible plans of how to tackle an issue like this with governmental way of tackling it, actually reaching out to the government for laws to be established to make sure that our physical media doesn't disappear to companies like the ACCC here with this article that I found to be absolutely hilarious here in March saying that the ACCC had made the game industry its target for 2025. By the way, this is the Australian competition and consumer commission that is advocating for these things to be regulated and i know that i'm glossing over quite the important topic really quickly here but if you want a deeper breakdown of what these things have been about please do make sure to check out a video for my curse farm i will leave it in the description below that being said i am not the one to focus on like the doom and gloom of the gaming industry i i don't like that because it is quite apparent that we are still having a lot of fun playing video games despite every third video saying that the gaming industry is dying it's not it's just going in a direction that we don't want it to and naturally that starts with the developers this brings up a sentiment that i and most likely a bunch of you have had with the structure of the companies that make the games that we enjoy so much and the thought that has been echoed by the ceo of Lyrian studios van I I keep on seeing the same, same, same mistakes over and over and over, and it's always the quarterly profits. The only thing that matters is the numbers. And then you fire everybody, and then like next year you're going to say, shit, I'm out of developers, and you're going to start hiring people again, and then you do acquisitions, and then you put them in the same loop again, and it's just broken and broken and broken. You don't have to. You just can make reserves, slow down a little bit, slow down on the greed, be resilient, take care of the people, don't lose the institutional knowledge that's been built up in all of those people that you lose every single time, so that you have to go through the same cycle over and over and over. The thing is that Larian is, and most likely will remain, an independent studio. Well, technically. And I do indeed mean stranglehold because these are not incompetent studios that we are seeing here. Studios like Arcane, Rocksteady, you name them and not even to touch on the big ones like Ubisoft, Bethesda and EA. Let's focus on those who are stuck under some publishers. When they quite literally are working on stuff that are the antithesis of what is supposed to be playing to their strength, what else are you going to call it? It does speak volume to that influence. But that being said, the greed is indeed very real. And that has a lot to do with how the companies have decided to structure themselves and how they've been bothering up to shareholders so well that they started copying the growth tactics of the tech developers. Epic Games, as an example, is a publisher. They might have one of the leading games in the world, but they have not developed much else that has been able to match the success of Fortnite ever since. And maybe they don't have to, because what they have to their benefit, however, is one of the most powerful gaming engines out there with Unreal. One that is so influential, in fact, that we have some of the big other tech companies like Nvidia constantly making the software working in tandem with the development of theirs. And now that I'm mentioning the tech, it's not just about how NVIDIA representatives are showcasing the last AI-powered software that can match the dystopian Apple Vision Pro or the latest graphics cards where you need to sell a kidney in order to afford it. Which, for those of you who are watching, you don't need those, okay? You don't. Unless you are like a content creator working on some 3D stuff or whatever, you don't need those graphics. Card. If a developer is not able to optimize a game to work on, let's say, 8-year-old hardware for the minimum spec at least, they don't deserve your money. No, it's not just that. They are adopting the mannerism of the tech companies, like, for example, good old Todd Howard and the way that he mimics Steve Jobs. It all just works. It just all works. It just, boom, pops to life and works. All of this just works. It's not, I'm not kidding, lights and other items. And then you run wires that connect them all. And again, it, it just works. Like, I seriously can't wait for Todd to try to emulate that uh, Theranos chick's eyes. The death stare is fucking haunting. 
And it goes further as the corporate and financial structure is now the same as the big tech companies. And while the initial intention, I will suppose, has always been great because, well, nobody wants to fail with like vision of grandeur and like Peter Molyneux expiring to revolutionize the games that we all love uh, with new tech. Uh, where the hell is beyond good and evil to how huh, Ubisoft? As they grow, the de facto goal of the company is no longer just about making good games, but to grow the business, to make more profit. And you can argue where the obligation for that lies in, for the suppliers, the customers, the shareholders, and even your employees, because a failure in growth means stagnation. Stagnation means that you cannot pay better wages to your workers, that you cannot live up to what the shareholders demands, and eventually your company starts going downhill. And even if you set out with the goal of making the best game possible and actually manage to succeed with that endeavor, it doesn't automatically mean that it is going to be profitable for your company at all. We see plenty of examples of banger titles out there just in the last few years that have definitely been good, but have not exactly amounted to good returns for the creators. A good example for this is Remedy's fastest growing game Alan Wake 2, a beloved game by many that has sold over 1.4 million copies by now, but has yet to make the profit back to the company. And this is where this idea of pricing, for example, comes into play, right? They sold the game for what, 50 or so dollars instead of the 70 that the usual games are now sold for? So like, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that obviously, while not pricing your game at the typical AAA title that we are so familiar with, you are not going to make the expected profit. And thus a company might be tempted to raise those prices and change certain business practices, which might not straight up be done for nefarious purposes, right? As for an example, recently in a discussion, a friend of mine asked my opinion on why it is that developers are willing to drown themselves in complicated uh, proprietary systems, where instead of using the skills and developer hours on writing useful or these functional features, they spend their times updating dependency, fixing deployment pipelines and shit for systems that quite literally don't work, I simply answered that it is because it pays better. The pros of working for a big studio or having your studio under a big publisher remains the security for many. The pay is better, there are better resources, better budget, longer development time, of course, depending on the project. Okay, depending on the position that you might have in the company, there's less... I suppose, a uh, creative output. But most importantly of all is how you don't need to worry about the marketing. Like, for example, can you tell me of any of the latest indie titles that you have encountered on a billboard, on a TV ad, on something while scrolling through your phone, uh, freaking at a bus stop somewhere where you are taking public transportation? It doesn't happen. You've most likely learned about them by watching your favorite content creator. And occasionally, of course, if they end up in the trending page for steam or get glazed to high heaven on social media glazed to high heaven on social media wow that's a new uh that's a new sentence that i never thought that i was think about <laughs> Anyways, it's an incentive that is good for game developers or creative people who want to work in the field of video game making. But the problem with this view is that in recent years we have seen that this is no longer something that is sustainable. People are being mass laid off just because it is more profitable for a company to quite literally lay off people and make a profit. It's the good old Boeing mentality. For those of you who may understand the hint to the whole thing that's been going on with Boeing recently, straight up companies that are building stuff based on the legacy of excellence that they've had for quite some time and now can just ride the wave of what they used to be while fucking up everything in the background for both the workers, the customers and everything else, while still engaging in the tactics like uh, stock buybacks to inflate the uh, revenue values of uh, what the shareholders are observing and make it peak. An example that I can uh, take is uh, such things as uh, Google. Looking at the alphabet groups more specifically, here where we check out the alphabet investor report for the highlights of uh, Q 2023, we can see that the revenue has increased in 2023 in comparison to the same time in 2022. Now, uh, this is great. Obviously, companies increase and that's good for them. The problem is, however, when we go a little bit down and we start looking at more than just the revenue, but also additionally to such things as the liability. 
What this shows is obviously that this too has increased. Uh, besides such areas as uh, what do we have here? Yes, compensation and benefits. Obviously, those uh, areas are not increasing as much as uh, the rest should. But everything else in just about all the other areas, they've become a lot more liable. Now, the reason mostly for why this has been happening is when we look at the additional information regarding the uh, revenue here. And this has something to do with a reduction in the workforce and office spaces. This has resulted in layoffs which has amounted to over 2.1 billion dollars that they had to give for severance packages and sold and all that in the end of uh, september 2023 now what does this mean this means that it cost a hell of a lot of money to hire and to fire the workforce in these companies but the income that they get back from the shareholders is much higher i.e. just like how the tech companies are operating, it is a lot more profitable for gaming companies to be laying off people of the wazoo. And this constant tactic of faking it till you make it, it's what is absolutely ruining the gaming industry. If we were to be using the gaming industry is ruined kind of uh, uh, talking point. Other ways to mitigate this? Can a company that is uh, open for market share able to withstand uh, the trials of uh, the downturn sometime? Obviously, there are. Uh, Ubisoft, for one, uh, they, they are the subject of this video mainly, have done somewhat of their part to try to mitigate it. They have enough areas to be working on where they uh, can compensate by hiring uh, people to work on different projects that has actually ended up in them laying off less people in comparison to other studios. Even if Gimo, uh, the CEO, uh, took some of his pay away to I, I suppose help the company out. It's not straight up on the scale of like Satoru Iwata from Nintendo some years ago who took like half of his pay away to make sure that uh, uh, his company stayed afloat while, while the Nintendo that was failing uh, back then. Japan and most of the Eastern companies have a different uh, way of saying things. There are laws that are set in place to make sure that people cannot just be laid off for no reasons. You straight up actually have to trick an employee into believing that it might be a best choice to go and work somewhere else because they are always uh, engaging in the, long, in the long term when it comes to their employment practices. But unfortunately for Western company, the greed for the higher ups remains very prevalent. Everybody knows of the stories of the likes of fucking Bobby Kotick, the actual devil, leaving Activision Blizzard with a severance package that is <laughs> absolutely insane. But I'm going to pause the game here because, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I need to finish this. It, it helps me communicate things better when I'm gaming as well. This has all to do with the game devs and their employers, the companies themselves. Because, yes, they are a part of the equation. We can't just remove them and only focus on us, the consumers. They, are, at the end of the day, are the ones that provide us with a lot of the good stuff that we enjoy. Would it be nice to see everybody employ the same methods as indie companies and indie studios? Definitely. But the unfortunate thing is that uh, it, it might not be where many will want to be because of this whole thing of the security that it might provide. Although this one too is shifting. However, we can also not just focus on them and say that yes, there are some workers there that needs to be validated more, that perhaps need to unionize to make sure that they get better paid and better working condition. We as the customers actually also matter. While some of the practices they do engage in has resulted in gaming being more accessible to people who might not have the best hardware. I'm gaming on a 3080 Super right now with a wonderful 140 hertz monitor that is ultra wide. I, I have no 
place to complain about the gaming position right now. But there are some people in some third world countries who have now access to, let's say, the many mobile games that are now to a certain extent at the same quality as some of the titles that I am playing on this very system that I have. This cannot be ignored, but these companies, if they are not mitigated, if they are not regulated, are going to take these things to somewhere where neither of us are going to be enjoying this. So yeah, this does not uh, bode well, especially when it comes to Ubisoft and especially when it is a single player experience, because we know that like many of the other titles that they made out there, they are going to try to milk as much money as from this as possible. And it does not sit right with me. But I, I think that I've covered a bunch of topics re relating to not just this very thing with Star Wars Outlaws. Uh, let let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I need to head downstairs and be a dad. And yeah, that being said, uh, have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye.